This video is a continuation from the previous video in which we derived the equations of motion for the transverse vibrations of a slender beam, an Euler-Bernoulli beam, and we solved those equations in general terms. We found that W of x of t, the transverse displacement, could be written as a function of t multiplied by a function of x. The function of t, t of t, we found to equal c1 cosine of omega t plus c2 sine of omega t. And the W equation, which is the equation for the mode shapes, or from which the mode shapes will come, is d1 cosh, or hyperbolic cosine, of beta x plus d2 sinh beta x plus d3 cosine of beta x plus d4 times sine of beta x. Okay, and we, we talked about boundary conditions, varying various boundary conditions. And in particular, what we want to look at is the simply supported case in this problem. And by simply supported, we mean a beam. Oh, that's not a very good beam. That is pinned at each end. So it cannot displace, but it's free to rotate at each end. Okay, and we found out that the boundary conditions from that, and you can go back to the previous video for this, were that... that at x equals 0 and L, the displacement is 0, and the moment which led to the second derivative of W being 0. So the moment is 0, which means W comma xx is 0, and the displacement is 0. All right, so we need to take, well, let me number these. One, two, three, four, and five. And the idea is we want to substitute four and five into equation three. So at x equals zero, we find that w of 0 is equal to, well, cosh of 0 is 1, sinh of 0 is 0, cosh, uh, cosine of 0 is 1, and sine of 0 is 0. So what that means is that we end up with d1 plus d3 is equal to 0. Call that equation 6. Okay, the derivative, w comma xx is equal to, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, the derivative of cosh is sinh, and the derivative of sinh is cosh, positive in both cases. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, but the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is positive hyperbolic sine. Okay? Um, so what this means is, this would equal beta squared d1 times 1. This would cancel out the second term. Third term would be plus beta squared d3. Fourth term cancels out, and that again is 0. Well, clearly as a result of 6 and 7, both d1 and d3 are equal to 0. Let me just draw these graphs here, in case you're not familiar with it. The hyperbolic sin or hyperbolic sine function looks 
well, it's not a very good drawing of it, but something like the x cubed graph. And the hyperbolic cosine looks kind of like a parabola. So this is cosh of x, uh, cosh, cosh of x, and this goes through 1. And this is cinch of x. This goes through 0. Okay, so at 0, cinch is 0 and cosh is 1. And that might make this a little bit clearer. All right, so the next boundary condition says that at x equals L, W of L is equal to, we already know that D1 and D3 are equal to 0, so we can just look at these two terms. And this will become D2 cinch beta beta times L plus D4 sine of beta times L is equal to 0. Call that equation 8. Okay, again, taking the second derivative with respect to x at L. Second derivative of cinch is beta squared d2 cinch beta times l. And when we take the second derivative of sine, we end up with minus sine, excuse me, minus beta squared sine. Now, the beta squares can cancel. Let me just do that in red. Okay. And if we add these two equations together, I left up my d4 here. Hope that's clear. This is a d4, the constant that I left up. So if we add these two equations together, we get d4 sine beta L minus d4 sine beta L. Those terms cancel, and we end up with 2 times d2 times cinch beta L equals 0. Well, this implies that d2 is also equal to 0. So what we're left with so far is that w of x is equal to d4 times sine of beta x. All right? And based on this, w comma xx at l is equal to beta squared minus beta squared d4 sine beta l equals 0. We can cancel the beta squared again. Now, you might remember that we did this for the, uh, uh, the multi-degree of freedom problem, where we said for non-trivial solutions, we can't have d4 equal to 0 because then w is just going to be equal to 0. And sure, that satisfies this equation, but that's trivial. It doesn't really tell us anything. So the other thing we've got to say is that sine beta of L must be 0. Well, when is the sine function 0? Let me draw it up here. Sine function is 0 at pi, at 2 pi, at 3 pi, etc. This is sine of x. This is x. So at n times pi, this is equal to 0. So this must imply that beta times L is equal to n pi. 
Or I can say in general that beta, and we'll say beta sub n, is equal to n pi divided by L, where n equals 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 all the way to infinity. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Let me just say it again. For non-trivial solutions, D4 cannot be equal to 0. Therefore, sine BL, beta L, should be equal to 0 at all times. Well, that could be equal to zero if beta L is always equal to n times pi, some integer times pi, because we know the side function is zero at any multiple of pi. Let's continue. And so just for completeness, I'm going to rewrite what we said on the last page, that beta n is equal to n pi divided by L where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, all the way to infinity. So, w of x, and we'll actually say w sub n of x, remember that w is now just the mode shapes. Uh, that is equal to d, well, it would be d sub n, let me write it out and then I'll explain it, times sine beta n, times x. Which is equal to dn sine n pi x divided by L. And omega, I mean, wn is called, they're the mode shapes. They're an infinite number of mode shapes because this is an infinite degree of freedom problem. We know from the multi-degree of freedom problem that for each degree of freedom, we have an eigenvector. Well, this is the same idea, only instead of it called an eigenvector, we call it an eigenfunction. Eigenfunction. Yeah. And I'll remind you of a result we came up with the previous in the previous video that says omega is beta squared times the square root of EI over rho A, where EI is the flexural rigidity of the beam, and rho A is the, it's the density times area, it's the mass per unit length, is actually what it is. And so these mode shapes are um, sine functions. So what does that mean? Well, let me try to draw it. Be a little bit tricky, but let me see if I can pull it off. So we'll do this in different colors. The first mode shape is sine pi x over L. Sine pi x over L would look something like this. Where this is L. Well, let me do that in black. So this is sine pi x over L. This is L, this is zero. So if we just approximated it using one mode shape, that's how we would approximate it, just with the, the first one. This is sort of like using a Taylor series. I hesitate to say that because it's not really a Taylor series. But I remind you, just like in the case of the eigenvectors or mode shapes for the n degree of freedom system, each of these mode shapes is orthogonal, which means there's no component of one in the direction of the other, or the dot products between them would be zero. So the lowest modes tend to contribute the most. And as we add additional modes, we add accuracy. Um, so if we did a one mode approximation, that's what it would be. If we wanted to add the second mode, which would be sine two pi x over L. Uh, let's see if I can draw this. It would look like that, sine 2 pi x over L. Um, try my luck and see if I can do 3 pi. So this sine pi has one peak, sine 2 pi has two peaks, sine 3 pi would have three peaks, and it would look something like this. This would be sine 3 pi x over L. Okay, I'm not going to go any further than that, but uh, you get the idea, hopefully. 
So with each one of these mode shapes that I add, my approximation of the actual shape becomes more and more accurate. All right, so just to complete this, um, I remind you that W of X of T, X and T, I should say, is equal to T of T times W, capital W of X. And we remember that T of T is equal to C1 cosine omega T plus C2 times sine of omega T. And putting it all together, we can now write W as an in infinite sum from n equals 1 to infinity of C1 sub n, C sub 1 n, cosine omega t plus C2 n sine omega t times the mode shape. Now, I can ignore the d constant because that will get absorbed into these two constants. And I can just write this as sine n pi x divided by L. I forget what number equation this is. Let me go back and have a look. 8, 9... We'll call this 10. And I remind you that the initial conditions, we looked at this in the previous video, is that at time equals zero, the displacement field is known, W uh, of X comma zero is equal to W sub zero of X. And also W dot velocity at X zero is equal to W dot zero of X. And substituting the initial conditions into this equation would now give you the constants C1 and C2 for each N. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If so, please go ahead and give it a thumbs up. That way other people can get to watch it. Thank you very much for watching and we'll catch up with you in the next video.